Chapter 4 So, this is home? How many of your little Drinogs live in the system anyway? Will asks as the ghost passes through two massive bulk freighters, having received expedited ground clearance. Will assumes there are lots of expletives being thrown their way as he moves the ghost between ships, waiting for their turn to land or dock with one of the over a dozen space stations that orbit Bray. Zephyr looks up from her station. They have cleared us to the planet, a spaceport in Parage. She looks down at her station again. I have the coordinates. Sending them to you now, Will. Benny spins his chair around. One, Grolak off. Two, do you guys know anything about Bray? Will and Zephyr shake their heads, but Maxim nods. I was stationed on orbital station Namek for one half cycle, he says, then grimaces. It was different. A carrier I was assigned to passed through the Bray system 18 cycles ago, Gabe offers. We did not linger long before continuing on to the Drago 7. Benny shrugs. Okay, so that's a no then. Parage is the capital of the planet. It's really three cities that over centuries grew so big they merged into the largest city on Bray. My folks live in an estate on the edge of Green Space 12. He pauses. They're rich, my parents. Like, very, very rich. Most Braylac breed frequently, having large broods. My parents were too busy for that. They had two broods, mine and one other. The second brood are all useless nobodies, but my brood? Well, I'm not the most successful of my siblings. You're a success? Will asks. And how rich are we talking? Benny gives him the one-finger salute before continuing. Very. Anyway, the rest of my broodmates have all done pretty well for themselves. One of my sisters is a successful vid star and musician. Very successful. Another is an award-winning writer. You've heard of Mopo Hogwant? When Will shakes his head, Benny sighs. She's one of the richest of my broodmates. Explains why she's been kidnapped, Zephyr says. Maxim nods and adds, Good book, too. Will spares his tactical officer a questioning look, then turns his attention back to the main display. Why did your parents buck the Braylac norm of spawning many broods? Gabe asks. Because they were very busy building an empire. They own a shipping company. Actually, they own the shipping company. Benny gestures to the small tactical screen set off to one side of the main display, which is currently showing the 200-plus vessels waiting to land or dock. Most of those are theirs. He looks at the main display and the approaching planet, then back to Will. Plus, they're part of a minority that feels we may be overpopulating the planet. Better late than never, I suppose, Zephyr says. Will is focused on the main display as the ghost moves into the upper atmosphere. He lets out a whistle. So why'd Mom call you? I'm not exactly incapable, you know, Benny protests. I'm quite skilled at things and stuff. Gabe tilts his head to one side. Really? Benny scowls. Fine, she knew I ran with you all. We do have news on Bray, you know. We're a GC core world, after all. She knows all about the crew of the ghost. Maxim smiles. That makes more sense. Your mom needs us. You're just extra. He deftly dodges the pad that sails across the bridge toward him, catching it before it strikes the bulkhead behind him. Okay, hold on. Atmospheric engines coming online, Will says, as the view screen clears of clouds. The landscape ahead is a bustling metropolis, hundreds of kilometers in diameter. Four spaceports are visible, mixed in with industrial areas and parklands. The ship launches as the sublight engines disengage, and the atmospheric engines ignite with a loud boom that reverberates through the ship. Would you look at that? I've never seen a city that big, Will says, working the controls. Biggest city on the planet, Benny repeats, then sighs and turns back to his console, mumbling something about humans. Then he adds, I didn't think I'd ever come back here. By the way, Benny... Can we stick to siblings from now on? Broodmates creeps me out, Will says, guiding the ship toward their designated spaceport. 
Makes me think of the final scene in Aliens. Ignoring Will, Maxim asks, Why did you never intend to return? Zephyr adds, I'd always assumed it was because your family was broke, or you were wanted for a whole slew of crimes. Being rich isn't all it's cracked up to be, Benny says, not looking up from his screens. I wouldn't know, Maxim offers, as the ghost maneuvers around the spaceport, slowly lowering to approach their designated landing pad. Is that a crowd? Will asks. Warm welcome. This is different, Will says, as he guides the ghost onto a landing pad in a part of the spaceport obviously designated for much nicer ships and personal yachts. Benny smirks. Like I said, rich family, we don't park on the outskirts. Zephyr turns from her station. We're cleared through customs and got a kind of oddly warm welcome message. You might be worth more than I thought, Benny. Hilarious. Come on, let's go get the party over with. Will looks over to the small greenish hacker. Party? Just wait, Benny says as he leaves the bridge. Zephyr turns back to her station, then frowns and looks at Maxim. The spaceport controller just asked if anyone aboard has any allergies they should be aware of. Weird, Maxim says. Will jumps out of his seat, quickly securing his station. Well, come on. Free food is free food. As Will leaves the bridge, Maxim looks at Zephyr. He's clearly never eaten Braylock food before. This should be interesting. He chuckles and offers his hand. She takes it, and they head out of the bridge. As the cargo ramp lowers, Will exclaims, What in the hell is that smell? He pulls the collar of his brown duster up to cover his nose, to no avail. Benny looks up at him. What are you talking about? Will looks at Benny, then the rest of the crew, and again back to Benny. Really? You don't smell that? Zephyr shakes her head, and Maxim shrugs. Gabe offers. My nose is cosmetic. It does not process olfactory information. Benny grimaces. No one needs to know that. Will pinches his nose. Agreed. Okay, well, guess it's something only I can smell. Lucky me, let's go. Benny rests a hand on Will's forearm, stopping him. Just remember, this won't be a great example of Braylax society. My family is... sort of unique. Will is about to say something, then... Benary is shouted so loudly from somewhere nearby that he jumps. Benny frowns and trots down the ramp. At the bottom, a small crowd seems to have materialized out of nowhere. What the? How did they just appear? We're standing right here. Will stammers. He looks around. Are there tunnels? At the bottom of the ramp, the group of thirty or so Braylack are chattering to each other, to Benny, and seemingly to anyone who glances at them, which now includes Maxim, Zephyr, Will, and Gabe. Benny at the center of the mass of short beings waves one arm, causing the crowd to part, and allow the crew to make their way to him. He is standing next to two other Braylack. The male is in what looks like a business suit to Will, the kind a toddler wears to church. The female, Benny's mom presumably, is in a voluminous moo-moo. Benny disentangles himself from the two just long enough to make some introductions. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Volvo, Will says. So you're the human, Benny's dad says. I thought you'd be more imposing and less pink. Oh, and you can call me Kara Ree. Will blushes a little. Well, I mean, there isn't a lot of natural light on the ghost. It's hard to keep a tan. Oh, look at it. I think it's cute. Benny's mom chimes in, taking Will's hand. Will sputters. It? Benny turns the conversation as quickly as he can. Okay, well, let's get the party over with. It? Will repeats. Zephyr puts her hand on Will's shoulder. Calm down. Benny spends what feels like to Will forever introducing the rest of the welcoming party, all 30 of them. By the time Will gets to the last introduction, he's forgotten the first name. That job done, Benny leads the rest of the crew and the massive entourage out of the spaceport. You have a castle?
The main hall of the Volvo estate is as big as a football field, 700 if not a thousand Braylacker jammed inside. At the center of it all, a table 20 feet long is occupied by the crew of the Ghost and Benny's immediate family. Man, I feel like we need to have a long chat later. Will is looking around the room. You have literally watched my movies and read my books, and who knows what else in my private data store, not to mention whatever you put Alf through. And none of us knew your folks had a freaking castle? He grabs a goblet of something from a passing server. Does Zarix know? Benny stops talking to one of his siblings to turn to Will. Well, you know, family castles don't come up all that often. Plus, you've worked with Zarix. Has he ever shown any interest in your personal life? Good point. Maxim and Zephyr are seated opposite Will and Benny, surrounded by members of the Volvo family. Benny, Zephyr says, You said your family is small, but there are hundreds of Braylac in this hall. You're related to them. All of them? Benny looks around. Well, sure. I mean, not directly. They're not all brood moth siblings. Remember, my folks only had two broods. Most of these folks, he waves his hand expansively, they're aunts, uncles, and cousins. That one, he says, pointing to a Braylac not much older than himself. That's my older brother, Whippery. He's in finance, one of the smaller banks here on Bray. He points to a Braylac woman two tables away. That's my younger sister, Val Lu. He pauses, then shouts, Hey, Val, what do you do again? Benary, you Krebnak, I manage your fleet. The woman turns back to the other relation she was speaking with, continuing her conversation. Oh yeah, that's right, Mom and Dad promoted her last cycle. It was in the newsletter. And that's my cousin Mal Dury. He must be visiting. He actually works on Pelor at one of the larger banks. From the head of the table, Kara Ri clears his throat. The room falls silent as every single Braylac at every single table turns to him. Will looks down at them, disoriented. Are we on a platform? When did that happen? How high are we? House Volvo welcomes home one of its own. Benary, we welcome you. The old Braylac raises a glass in a gnarled little hand. Welcome home, son. Benny smiles. Thanks, Dad. It's good to be back. Will nudges him. You said you never wanted to come back here. The Braylac hacker doesn't look at Will. Polu, Benny's mom, looks forward, looking down at Benny. Your sister, Lin Lu. Can you rescue her? Benny raises both arms in an expansive gesture. Sure, we do this kind of thing all the time, Mom. What can you tell us about the kidnappers? And the kidnapping, Maxim adds. Polu gathers herself. Lin Lu had finished a press tour for her latest release. She was en route to dinner here at the compound when her air car was attacked and forced down in industrialized zone 17. She was able to send a distress call before they jammed her vehicle's comms. Here she shudders, and Kara Ree puts a hand on his mom's arm, patting it. We notified the authorities and dispatched our security forces. You have your own security forces? Will whispers to Benny, who waves him away. A loud rumble comes from Will's stomach. The table goes quiet and all eyes turn to Will, who blushes, then grimaces a bit. He makes a go-on motion. Polu clears her throat and continues. Yes, well, by the time our forces and city security arrived, she was gone. We couldn't find any sign of her. Her driver was dead. What exactly did your daughter do for a living? Zephyr asks. Lin Lu was a successful vid star, Kara Ree answers. She had made several top-grossing vids over the last several cycles. He glances around the massive room. She is one of our most successful children. Benny glowers. Just stopped an intergalactic civil war, but no big deal, he mutters. Oh, and you know, saved the entire GC from a monster warship, Warren bent on eradicating all life, but sure, Lin Lu is the most successful one. Zephyr raises her hand. Has there been a ransom demand or any communication with the kidnappers? Kara Ree nods. There has. They sent a message two days ago. He reaches in his tunic and removes a small device. Setting it on the table, he presses a button. 
The device lights up and a holographic image forms slowly above it. Will can see a young Braylack woman, clearly scared, but otherwise looking unharmed. Mom, Dad, they want 42 million credits. They say they'll return me safely if you meet their demands. She looks off to the side, where someone is heard mumbling to her. Oh, and they want one of your yachts. The holographic video cuts out, and the device goes dark. Kara Ree reaches for the device, but Zephyr stops him. May we have this? I'd like to look it over. Plus, I'd like to see if Gabe and Benny can learn anything from it. The elder Braylack nods. Of course. No deadline was given or payment details, Maxim observes. There was a file that came with the hollow player, Po Lu explains. It had banking details for an account on Grapnar and a deadline of next Byresh. She looks at them both, her expression pained. Her eyes glisten as tears form. Benary, you have to help your sister. We will, Mom, Benny says, looking over at Will, who nods. And we'll have to hurry.